Welcome back to Deep Learning. So today's lecture, we want to talk about activations and convolutional neural networks. We will split this up into several videos and the first one will be about activation functions. Later we will talk about convolutional neural networks, convolution layers, pooling and so on. Deep learning. So let's start with activation functions. And you can see that the activation functions go back to the biological motivation. And we remember that everything we've been doing so far, we somehow also motivated with the biological configuration. So it's like, ooh, AI. Where we see that these neurons are being connected with synapses to other neurons. And this way, they can actually communicate with each other. The synapses have this myelin sheath. And with this, they can actually electrically be isolated. And this way, they are able to communicate to other cells. Now, when they are communicating, they are not just sending information, everything that they get in, but they have a, a selective mechanism. So if you have some stimuli, it actually does not suffice to have some signal, but the total signal must be above some threshold. And what will then happen is that an action potential is triggered, it repolarizes, and then returns to the resting state. Interestingly, it doesn't matter how strongly the cell is activated, it is always returning the same action potential, and then it returns to its resting state. The actual biological activation is even more complicated, so you have the different axons and they are connected to the synapses in other neurons and on the path they are covered within Schwann cells that then uh, can deliver this uh, action potential towards the next synapse. There are ion channels that are actually used to stabilize the entire electrical process and bring this whole thing again into equilibrium after the activation pulse. So what we can see is the knowledge essentially lies in the connections between the neurons. We have both inhibitory and excitatory connections. The synapses uh, anatomically enforce feed-forward processing. So it's very similar to what we've seen so far. Uh, however, those connections can be in any direction. So there can also be cycles. And you have entire networks of neurons that are connected with different axons in order to form different cognitive functions. Crucial is the sum of activations. Only if the sum of activations is above the threshold, then you will actually end up with an activation. And these activations are electric spikes with a specified intensity. And to be honest, the whole system is also time dependent and they also encode the entire information over time. So it's not just that we have a single event that passes through, but the whole process runs at a certain frequency and this enables the entire processing over time. But it's all going to happen. I mean, we are going to get to human level intelligence. Now, activations in artificial neural networks so far, they were nonlinear activation functions and mainly motivated by the universal function approximation. So if we don't have the nonlinearities, we can't get a powerful network. Without the nonlinearities, we would just enable matrix multiplication after matrix multiplication. Of course, we are building on all these um, great abstractions that people have invented over the millennia, such as matrix multiplications. So compared to biology, we have some, some sign function that can model an all or nothing response. Yeah. But generally, our activations have no time component. And maybe this could be modeled by activation strength. The sine function, of course, is mathematically undesirable because the derivative of the sine function is zero everywhere except at zero, where we have infinity. It's over 9,000! So this is absolutely not suited for backpropagation. So far, we've been using the sigmoid function because we can compute an analytic derivative. Now the question is, can we do better? 
So let's look at some uh, activation functions. And the most simple one that we can think of is a linear activation where we just take the input, we may want to scale it with some parameter alpha, and then get the output. If we do so, we would get a derivative of alpha. It's very simple. It would render the entire optimization process into a convex problem, but we don't introduce any nonlinearity. So we only list it here for completeness, and it would not allow you to build uh, neural networks as we know them. Uh, everything that you would construct would simply collapse down to matrix multiplications. Now, the sigmoid function is the first one that we started with. It essentially has a saturation towards 1 and 0. So it has a probabilistic output, which is very nice. But it saturates for x going towards very large or very low values. You can see here that the derivative already around 3 or minus 3, we are approaching 0 very quickly. And another problem is that it's not zero-centered. Well. The problem with the zero centering is that you always produce positive numbers. Independent of what input you get, your output will always be positive because we map towards values between zero and one. Then this means that if we had a signal with zero mean as input into this activation function, it will always be shifted towards a mean that will be greater than zero. And uh, this is called covariate shift of successive layers. So the layers constantly have to adapt to the shifting distribution. As a result, batch learning reduces the variance sigma of the updates. So what can we do in order to compensate this? Well, we can work with other activation functions, and a very popular one is the tangens hyperbolicus. Tangens hyperbolicus is shown here in blue. You can see that it has very nice properties. For example, it's zero-centered and has already been used by Lecun since 91. So you could say it's a shifted version of the sigmoid function. But one main problem, of course, remains, and this is the saturation. So you can see that maybe at 2 or minus 2, you already see that the derivatives are very close to 0. So it still causes the vanishing gradient problem. And that was my 1987 diploma thesis, which was all about that. Well, now the essence here is how does x affect y? our sigmoid and tangent hyperbolicus, they map large regions of x to very small regions in y. So this means that large changes in x result in minimal changes in y. So the gradient vanishes. So the problem is amplified by backpropagation, where you have then small steps of very small numbers, if they're close to zero, and you multiply those update steps with each other. So as a result, you get an exponential decay. The deeper you build the network, the faster the gradient vanishes, and the more difficult it is to update the lower layers. So a very related problem is, of course, the exploding gradient. So here we had the problem that we have high values, and those high values amplify each other, and we get this exploding gradient. So we can think about our feedback loop and the controller that we've seen before, you've seen that what will happen with your loss curve, uh, if you measure the loss over the training iterations, if you don't adjust the learning rates appropriately, then you get this exploding gradient or the vanishing gradient. But it's not just the learning rate either. The problem can also be amplified by the activation functions. And in particular, the vanishing gradient is a problem that occurs with those saturating activation functions. So we might want to think about that and see whether we can get better activation functions. So next time on Deep Learning, we'll exactly look at those activation functions. So what you've seen today are essentially the classical ones. And in the next session, we'll talk about the improvements that have been done in order to build much more stable activation functions and really enabling going into deep networks. So thank you very much for listening and see you in the next session. Bye-bye.